Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome into the Sports Fanatic News. Uh, Philadelphia Phillies season preview is I am Joe Borick, a.k.a. Projo, joined by the wonderful Andrew Santangelo with actually a background. Uh, back at his uh, humble <laughs> abode uh, rather than in a prison cell in his uh, college dorm. <laughs> so how are yeah. you doing today? Feels good to be home. I'm going to be more excited for opening day. and That's exciting. It's Easter weekend and everything going on. Got to get, get a couple days at home, so I'm going to be more excited right now for everything going on. Yeah, it's exciting with a uh, baseball season starting. Uh, my two favorite sports, hockey's in the home stretch, baseball season starting, so it's always good to see that. And the Phillies made it more exciting and easier for us. Uh, same with the Braves, uh, so we thank Snicker as well uh, for releasing their lineups at about 9 o'clock this morning. <laughs> so yeah, right. and- uh, so that, that worked out um, really well, um, and I'm really excited coming into this game, but... Um, I guess we could just dive right into it and we can start with, uh, I was looking at this really good article on MLB.com that uh, Andrew Simon did where he talked about all the matchups um, today and previewed them where he said, um, Noah's streak of four straight opening day starts would be the longest by a Phillies pitcher since Hall of Famer Steve Carlton had 10 in a row from 77 to 86. So with that being said, Andrew, I'll turn it over to you. How do we feel about Aaron Nola coming off of his spring training? We know spring training is kind of hogwash a bit. It's more to just get your tones in set when you're a veteran rather than when you're a rookie. It's to actually prove yourself. But what did you think of his spring? And uh, what do you think of him coming into this start now uh, in his four straight opening day start against Max Fried as well? Yeah, it was real quick. What's crazy about that as well, out of those – this out of the four starts on opening day, this is the third third one is against this is his third one against the Braves. So I find that kind of crazy in itself. Is yeah, he's had four starts, but three of them against the same team. Uh, it's funny how the scheduling kind of works out when you're playing the same team to start start the season. But uh, no, I think this spring he, he looked fairly well. I mean, yeah, he had some down starts here and there, but that's spring training. They're working on pitches. They're working on different things. I know he was trying to add one as well. I don't. I don't, from what I've read, I don't think he's comfortable yet using it. So I don't think you'll see it too much here in the opening. But he's never been a spring training pitcher. Like his career spring training stats are a 4 9 6 ERA, 6 and 7 record. So, like, it doesn't bother me to see him kind of struggling because that's what spring training is. His velocity is still there and everything. And that's what I look for make sure your velocity is still there because that's what's the most important when you're kind of working these things out. So I got no issues uh, with, um, with the way his spring went, and I'm excited to see him pitch today, and we, we know what he's been able to do against Atlanta. I mean, you go back to first year, Gabe Kapler. I mean, he dominated the Braves left and right. I mean, he was making them look silly, and obviously he gets pulled. I think it was, I mean, it was a while ago, but I think it was 66, 70 pitches, something like that. So, I mean, he's always ready for opening day. He's one of your most consistent pitchers, and, yeah, he always has – rough stretches here or there somewhere in the season. But, again, that's everybody throughout a 162 year. So I, I'm excited. I'm not worried about the way spring went. I, I'm just – I'm excited for him to get back out there, and I expect a, a solid performance here today. Yeah, I do too. I think he's been pretty good on opening day. I've kind of um, said it while leading into the question for you. Spring training for veterans um, is especially – uh, is more of just honing in, figuring out your pitches, uh, getting comfortable, getting the feeling again. Hitters and pitchers talk about that all the time. The only guys that are really trying to come in and feel like they're almost in midseason form by the end of spring training is some youngsters that don't really understand the whole yeah. realm of spring <laughs> training yet and are trying to prove them th- themselves uh, to the team, uh, rightfully uh, so. But I, I agree with you. I think Aaron Nola is going to come in, have a good um, – start and this will end up being a very good matchup against uh max freed of the braves um so what do you think uh of this pitching matchup the phillies obviously have uh harper and hazley both in the lineup as left-handers um going obviously we knew harper would stay in the lineup hazley's more of a surprise uh what do you think of the phillies um with the lineup they constructed against Max Fried today, uh, how do you feel about this lineup, which is, McCu- for people that don't know, McCutcheon's one, Hoskins two, Harper three, Real Muto four, Bohm five, Gregorius six, Segura seven, Heasley eight, and then this year with the pitcher batting, Nola nine. Uh, what do you think of how this lineup is constructed, and how do you feel they'll be able to attack 
uh, Max Freed and then some thoughts you might have on Max Freed as Atlanta starter. Yeah, I was had a fantastic year last year. I mean, he was in the Cy Young race for, I think it was 95% of the season before. I think it was a bad last start or two and kind of kicked him out of that Cy Young race. But I, I think overall, he's a fantastic pitcher. He mixes his pitches well. You're going to have to be on your toes throughout the whole game. Be ready for what's what's to come because it's not going to be it's not going to be anything easy. I mean, he's going to be challenging. Uh, I mean, you look at I mean, what he did last year against us. He pitched fairly well in, in most of his starts. And uh, when I was looking at the lineup and getting ready for the show, I was looking at some numbers and. You know, you look at Adam Hazley, yeah, he didn't face a lot of lefties last year, but I think part of his decision, it's not a guy that Quinn was able to hit. I mean, last year, Roman Quinn, and career-wise, but all of the at-bats for last year, Roman Quinn went 0 for 6 against Max Freed. So I think that kind of went into play. If he was 4 for 6 or 3 for 6, you'd probably see Quinn out there this uh, this afternoon. But I got no issues with it. I think we got to get Hazley hitting lefties if he's going to be that center fielder and that eighth pick we, we thought he was going to be when we took him. And I think that's he's going to have the chance this first week of the season to make his name for himself. He had a fairly good spring. So I'm excited to see what he's able to do. Harper, on the other hand, for a lefty-lefty matchup, he actually hits him well. He's hitting 308 and 13 at-bats, and half of his hits, or, yeah, half of his hits are home runs uh, against Freed. So I'm excited to see that. I will say Hoskins in the two and JT at the four, I almost feel like that flipped a little bit uh, just because I think JT uh, provides a little more spark there at two. I think, uh, I forget who I was listening to, it was actually Ricky Patalco uh, was talking on on the Fanatic the one day, um, and he was saying the only problem with Hoskins at the two, he gets on base and stuff, but he doesn't have that speed that other guys have to exactly. get on the bases. Yeah. So you're kind of uh, log jamming the top half of the order there with his speed rather than having a Harper or JT or even Alec Bowman at this point who runs well and gets on base just as amount, of, amount or pretty close to what he does. So that's that's the issue you have at two, where if Hoskins is hitting well, four or five, with you'll be able to hit the them two. in. Yeah, especially with Hoskins at the two, just to go off of that point real quick, when – Personally, I thought his legs look back under him and he's coming back good with Kutch in the spring, but some people still have questions. So if you go Kutch Hoskins, you might have two guys that are not as quick as they should be at the top of your lineup, even though I personally think Kutch is, looks like from spring watching him, he's getting his speed back. But we'll have to remain for that to be seen. That's just another point there. Um, you might rather, if you have McCutcheon, have another guy that has more definite speed in a real muto at the catching position second, usually rather than Hoskins, who's a little bit more of is, it, is if you hit Joey Votto second, who would get on base but not really move you to the next spot. He would just move up one base at a time. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be interesting, and that's what's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. I'm excited for it, though. I'm excited for this lineup. I think it's going to be one of the best offenses in baseball all around, if I'm being honest. Um, obviously the pitching, the back end of the starting rotations where some of the concerns are going to come in, but, but no, I think this offense, I mean, yeah, you obviously have the Dodgers. They're, they're just not a normal roster. That's how good no. they are. But outside either of them, is San Diego really. And, the, and they're not, see, even I, I think all honesty, our offense can compete with San Diego, like Dodgers. Yeah, they have the edge, but no, honestly, I think our offense is right there with San Diego. I think they just have a huge leg up on pitching is where it's going to be a difference with yeah. us too. But like, yeah, obviously they got Fernando Tatis. I mean, we have Harper, then they have Machado, we have JT. Well, overall roster structure, they're ridiculous. That's what I meant. Like, oh, we're yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. overall roster yeah, okay. structure. I, thought you, I said offense. I thought yeah. you were talking about the offense. But, yeah. yeah. No, that's yeah, they have the leg up on pitching, obviously, and that's where our two rosters really different, differentiate. But, no, yeah, I, I truly mean that. I think our offense can be, when they're clicking and everyone's going to be hitting, I think they can be as good as anyone in this league. Uh, again, obviously outside the Dodgers because they don't have one hole in their roster. Um, yeah. when, you have, when you have your – when you have your biggest question mark on the offense, probably going to be Gavin Lux, who was only the number one prospect in MLB like two years ago. Or AJ <laughs> I mean, Pollock, who still hit like 267 last year or whatever the hell he did. So, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. yeah, it's not really too big of a concern. But another thing, um, looking at the numbers, why I could see just this being a today thing for the lineup when it came to us talking about the second hole is – Maybe they want to get Reese more at bats to get going against Freed, since we know this is going to be a pivotal matchup going forward. He's a bona fide ace um, of the Brave, and that's going to be something if Hoskins gets going, he's going to have to face him a lot. He's only hitting 215 at bat against Freed, where Real Muto's hitting 389, by far the best of any of the uh, group in 18 at bats, with two homers and five RBIs against Freed. So I feel like maybe that's a today thing. 
and then we'll see JT go back to the two spot and see Reese kind of go back into the four spot, but maybe they want to give Reese an extra one or so at bat to so he can see Freed more since you know you don't have to worry about JT seeing Freed. He rocks him already, so put him in the our biggest RBI spot in the lineup. I kind of get what you're saying, but when, I would think you would want the opposite then. Because if JT's hitting him, you want JT to get more at-bats and JT to get on before Harper because Harper and JT have been your two best. So, I mean, I get it works the same way at 3-4, but if you move them up to 2-3, they both get more at-bats. You have a better chance to hit them in, in my opinion. But, I mean, no, I see what you're saying, though. Yeah, try to get a spark early on the season because obviously – Well, Walsh is the say- only problem, too, because the one issue with this MLB.com thing they do, which is cool with the matchup thing next to the lineup – is they don't tell you anything about the walks. So, like, he could have a 200 batting average, but have six walks in these 50. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the walk total is. So, it could I, have to do with something like that as well, where he figures if he can just see him well and get on base, yes, he's not fast, but you're hoping Harper or Real Muter are going to rip one anyway. So, as long as you're not as slow as Pat Burrell and you're on second base, you should be able to get home. <laughs> Yeah, well, I will say, I mean, here's Max Fried's number against the Phillies uh, in his career. 70, or excuse me, yeah, he's faced 77, uh, 77 at-bats, only 17 hits. Uh, he's given up four home runs, nine RBIs, uh, only eight walks from Freed, and he has struck out 22 hitters. So, And the Phillies are only hitting 220, 221 off him with an on-base percentage of 297. So, obviously... That's something uh, a pitcher that's kind of had our number a little bit. Hopefully, it's something on opening day we can get something different. But it's gonna be fairly cold, uh, a cold opener today. It's not you're not gonna have that heat kind of boiling there in the stadium. Obviously, it'd be fun having the fans back in there. So we'll see what kind of where the wind's blowing because I think it's supposed to be a little windy there as the the rain kind of continues to uh, end up or finish up what it was what was here. So it's going to be interesting to see what what the kind of day it brings for opening day. But I'm excited. I think it's going to be for the majority majority of the part a pitcher pitcher's duel here this afternoon. Uh, obviously, with two greats going on the mound. So we'll we'll see how the way it shapes up, and it should be an opening fun series. But let me tell you this: this opening, uh, not only a series, just the opening first couple weeks, if not month, is just going to be huge for this team. And th- I mean, not even just the Phillies, the Phillies, Mets, Braves, everyone. It's just a d- division battle in this opening month for what's going to be one of the best divisions in the league this year i mean we open up our first four or five series are all division opponents so this this is an important it's an important game to obviously get out it's not one of those okay well it's a long season you can kind of fool around for the first whatever amount of games or whatever no this is this is division uh, games right away first four series it's more important than usual i feel like yeah, I think it is, uh, too. And looking at it, it's supposed to be about 51 with wind at about 20 miles per hour set up to uh, when the game kicks off. So maybe that'll be blowing out to get some yeah, extra home runs. I don't, I don't know the directions well enough. In the air. Yeah, if it's going <laughs> to if it's going to help the pitchers or if it's going to help the hitters. But uh, we'll have to see as we come into the game. But I agree with you. It's really a juggernaut of the division uh, starting the season. So before. Um, as our uh, closing uh, thing on the podcast, we go into breaking down today's uh, stars of the game we think will come up and all that. Let's go into that real quick because we brought this up on Chasing the Pennant podcast um, with me, Rob, and uh, Biscuit. Uh, we th- Rob thought that if the Phil were the, uh, was the only guy that would admit that he thought the Phillies would make the postseason, where Biscuit and I said more like third place. Because um, we would both rather come into this season going – yeah, we think we're going to see improvements, but this division's ridiculous. The NL might even be more ridiculous than the AL as a whole, so it's not going to be easy. Um, where um, he went in and said, no, 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 I think they'll start off really well and end up making the postseason. So, number one, what do you think of the prediction to start off well? Do you see that happening? Because they have one of the toughest month of Aprils uh, with the interdivision play that having the Cardinals as one of the other teams in there. You get a break with the Rockies and Giants, potentially, but... We know the Giants were better than expected last year. So what do you think of uh, this first month of the season? And do you foresee the Phillies getting to a hot start or maybe having to do what they've had to do in years past and kind of pick it up a bit if they do want to make it uh, after this month of the season? Yeah, first off, I think in terms of these division games, I think you're going to play about 500 ball. If I'm being honest, I mean – I think I truly mean this when I say this too. Is I think this division is going to be so tight 
you can always flip a coin and, and pick some of these teams that are going to win. The over-under for me on the season is pretty low, honestly. It's set at 81.5. I think that's one of the best locks for, for this upcoming over-under season, honestly. I, I, I think this is at least an 85, 86 uh, win team. I, I really believe that, and I think with Dombrowski, I mean, if you're playing that kind of ball at the deadline, you're only going to add pieces with the, the kind yeah. of guy he is. So that's why I, I really think that's one of the, the best ones of the preseason uh, if you're looking at it. And I think that's going to bode well. I just think, I mean, this team has never been a team to get off to that hot start. Like, if you look in the past, even the good teams, I feel like, have always been around 500. Maybe you win 12 to 11 games, something like that. Maybe you're a little over 500. But I don't see that changing this year, if I'm being honest. I mean, I think we go open up these these first week. I think we open up the first week. I, I'll say four and two. I think you're going to win both series. I think you'll take two or one from the Braves, or two or three from the Braves, and then two or three from the Mets. But the problem is you turn them over, and then I think Atlanta does the same thing. I think Atlanta's going to take two or three in Atlanta. And then you and hope the Mets will split. do that in New York. Well, <laughs> you got a four game in New York. So I don't know how that hopes up. I hope you, you, you hope for a split. But then again, you go out of conference or out of division, and you only get probably the best team in the Central, and you're facing the Cardinals. So it's, it just doesn't let up for this team. So I think if you can scratch out 500 ball at the end of April, you have to take advantage of the Rockies and the Giants. You get the Giants at home, and then you go to Colorado. That's weird that Colorado just doesn't come up here. That's Anyway, um, but you, you get San Francisco home for three, and then you get an off day and travel to Colorado for three. So obviously those two teams you got to kind of take advantage of and make sure you win those two series because then after that, you end the month with four against St. Louis again and then one against the Mets. So, if yeah, I think if you can play 500 ball against those teams, you're doing yourself well uh, at the end of this month. And I think that's the direction we're going to go. As far as the playoffs, listen, I, I'm predicting 85, 86, 87, 85, 87 wins. That could be enough to get you in that second wild card spot. The problem is I think the Mets are slightly better than you. And I think the Padres are slightly better than you. So I unfortunately think those are going to be the two wild card teams. I think this year's playoff miss, though, is going to be different than the others. It's not like, oh, we're going to be under 500. I think you are going to be over 500. It's going to be an interesting season from game one to game 162. And I think that's where it's going to be different. And then this year, you're going to, I think it's going to be you just missed the playoffs and then you fix the rest, the final touches next offseason. And this team will be a playoff team in 2022. I know that's not what everyone wants to hear. But that's just the way I see it playing out. Yeah, it's progress, and I think that's pretty much what Biscuit and I were getting at on the chase in the pan, where both of us kind of sat around or a couple games above 500, so we think the team will show those improvements. I talked about how this year is just a year when uh, Rob presented the question of, is just to prove a year for Girardi. I would say it is more than last year, because last year, one, there was no fans. Uh, so the season wasn't even close to being a regular season. You've already talked about how this feels more like actual baseball. Um and two, um, I think this year you actually have a constructed roster that actually makes you go, okay, the manager should be able to pick the right bullpen pieces and should be able to do X, X, and X. Where last year you had the exact opposite. So uh, I think um, this is a year that he will prove himself. And I think this year is mainly about everyone you want to see take strides, take strides, like you said, get to a little bit over 500 and keep moving in the right direction, which is something I completely agree with. But what were you going to say? I think it's a spot where you're right. You already didn't have the pieces last year, and I think this is a year it's going to be really that change. You add the four pieces in the pen, and I think it's going to go well. I mean, again, I always said he's a similar manager to Capwish. I think it's funny how much of a pass he got last year because he basically manages the same way. But uh, I think, uh, no, I think this year's going to be, again, I kind of, I listened to what you guys were saying, and it was a great show and everything, and that's why I kind of agree with biscuit in the sense of you know he's going to be a great manager you know what he's done in the past and he's got that history this year he actually has the weapons to complete it yeah i mean we saw it i know i brought up on the podcast we saw it in new york when he had the man the people to actually man he did it very well you just didn't have that last season so obviously you're gonna look like you suck at your job because you have nobody to freaking throw it's like a coach in hockey that's coaching the like like jeff blashill for example with the red wings his numbers look like he sucks. Most people, if you ask around the league, think he's a very good head coach. So it's uh, that's a perfect example there. You can't do anything with a bad roster. So this year they constructed a good roster. Dombrowski came in, gave us the bullpen we need. I think things are moving in the right direction. Uh, you got Brogdon looking really good as a kid. Uh, you brought in Coonrod, who looked very good in spring. Hale was a pleasant surprise in spring. Uh, Kinsler, so you have everybody rolling in the right direction. 
So I agree with you. This season's about improvements. It's about uh, moving to the right mark. I unfortunately think they will be the team to just miss the wild card, but you see steady improvement, um, like we said. But um, to round out our um, show today, we can kind of just give who we think is going to be our stars of the game for um, this particular game this season, and if we think our fills are going to be able to take opening day. And why? So, uh, since I handed it over to you for a lot of stuff already on today's episode, I'll go first on this one. With I think from I kind of already hinted at who I think my star of the game would be by giving his batting line earlier, but uh, that would be Biscuit's favorite human being on the planet, JT Real Muto. Um, JT Real Muto's hitting 389 against Freed. You talked about how our lineup really struggles against Freed. He does not. So I think he's going to be a guy that really supplants himself and really does good in this lineup. A guy that I've seen doing more slap hitting. This one's going to surprise you, too. I don't always shout him out. But doing more slap hitting and actually hitting like I think he's supposed to and not getting messed up by our old hitting coach's tendencies and John Mealy um, is Segura, who I think matches up solid if he can get the fastballs from free. Obviously, we've seen Gene sometimes miss curveballs in the past being here in Philly. If he can kind of do like he did in Seattle and just slap at the curveballs perfectly, uh, just hit it where he's supposed to, I think those two will be the stars of um, this game for the Phillies and be the offensive reason they're able to win. And then Nola, as well as our new integrated bullpen, will be uh, the pitching reasons they're able to take this opening day 4-2. to two. I'll go 4-2. to two. Uh, <laughs> that, was what's your that, that is the exact score I was going to pick. Um <laughs> But uh, no, I I agree with you. I think JT's a great pick, and like you said, he's hit him well. So I think that's right up there for what's going to happen. Uh, my pick's going to be the young guy, uh, second in uh, rookie of the year voting last year. I'm going Alec Bohm. He only had two plate appearances against Freed, so I'm going to throw those out the window. Not a big track record there, but I like him hitting in the the five spot here this afternoon. I think he's going to get a lot of RBI chances. Uh, well, maybe not today, but obviously through the season. But I think, again, if we talk about, I mean, you look at, yeah, we talked about McCutcheon and Hoskins struggling at the top against Freed. But if you look at the 3-4, the guys hit before Alec Boehm, they've been the best hitters against Freed. So assuming Harper and JT get on, I think he'll have a couple RBI chances, whether it's just a lousy, or not lousy, but just a sack fly to, to left or right or whatever, or a, a big hit in the gap or something like that. I'm going to go with the young stud and Alec Boehm. And uh, just to say something different, I'll say that we get an extra run, and I'll go 5-2 Phillies win. Five two. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So you think Bones going to be the star? I think it'll be uh, Segura and Real Muto. And I think a guy that you always know is going to do something for you is Harper. So uh, we'll throw him in there as our uh, round out questions and closing. Put go ahead. So I was going to have a round out question for you, and I don't know if I'm stealing your last question. My bad. But I wanted to hear what your thoughts were when they announced that uh, Hector Neris is the closer over Archie Bradley. Because I know I was shocked by that. I was not expecting that at all. I thought when they signed Bradley, he was the guy. I expected Bradley to be the guy. I'm wondering if it's because they really talked up how Hector has really worked on now having that change and split option. So it really kind of throws off the hitters of being able to figure out if it's actually a changeup or a split coming in. Obviously, the split has a lot more late action to it than a changeup. So... Um, I think seeing how well he integrated that had a large input into it. I'm okay with it to start because I felt like it was always going to be a battle when I would listen to the Phillies talk podcast between Bradley and Nearest mainly, and then Alvarado would be the other cat thrown in there. So I feel like eventually it's going to come to a way where somebody takes it. And if it's Hector, great. If not, then I think he'll do well in the eighth inning role or wherever he pitches in the seventh inning if Alvarado has the eighth inning that game because this bullpen with Coonrod, with himself – with Alvarado and with others, has a lot more good moving parts this year to Absolutely. move people around rather than last season where you were kind of stuck. The only thing that – the more surprising part of the bullpen to me rather than that was sending JoJo down because now you only have one lefty until you figure out who your other lefty is going to become, which I think is just temporary uh, personally. And eventually That's about him. you might call up another lefty. JoJo and Tony Watson I was surprised about. I thought Watson was going to be uh, maybe. Yeah, I guess Watson might be because he would have been paid $3 million. They were talking about this yeah, was, talk when I listened to it, and he kind of stunk in spring. Like, it was that, and he would have opened up a roster spot because he was a yeah. nasty invite. And he didn't really show you signs to do so, where Kinsler showed you many signs of why you would want to open a roster spot for him. So I feel like it kind of just came down to 
those things. But no, my final point was just going to be, we might as well, since this is a season preview, say who we think our team Cy Young winner is going to be, who we think the reliever will step up the most, and who we think the team MVP uh, will be. So for me, I, I always like this signing since we made it in the offseason. I feel like you're going to go with Archie Bradley for the reliever, so I'll leave that for you. I've always liked Jose Alvarado. Uh, since he came in and his movement because, yes, he didn't have the sexiest stats this year, but I feel like you tend to sign and bring in relievers based off of their stuff and what you think you can make them into be, kind of like how you bring in goalies in hockey based off of their positioning and how you think you can mold them into their fullest form. So I feel like he's a guy the Phillies have already with Cotham and he's and uh, all the pitchers are really talking him up. I really like this young pitching coach. They've really come together and looked good. I know Girardi's had nice things to say about him on his uh, press conferences in spring. Alvarado would be my reliever of the year. I think he's going to look really good with that great wipeout slider, breaking ball, fastball combination. Uh, my team MVP, I would go with um, Harper's the obvious choice, but I think coming off of his contract, it took a while. We know he's so excited to be back here. I feel like it's going to be JT. I think JT set for maybe his biggest season. In Philly, coming off of that payday of Dombrowski now being the GM that he knows is fully behind him. Because as he said, as soon as Dave called him, he kind of knew everything was going to be all right at that point once he got hired and they were eventually going to figure it out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to pitching, I think the pitching MVP, I feel like I said this in the CTP also, Nola, if you want to make the postseason or push for it, he's going to be somewhere between five to seven in the Cy Young race because that's the way you're going to be there. So I feel like he's definitely going to be the pitching MVP. But uh, what would be your set of uh, people for that? Yeah, uh, starting off, I'll go in the same order. So I'll go reliever first. I'm going to go with uh, – I'm torn. I want to go with – they picked Hector to be the closer. I want to pick Hector Neris, but – I feel like at some point in the season, Archie might take over that closer role. So I think I'm going to lean towards Archie Bradley. He gave him the one year, six million. He's on a prove it year kind of contract. And I think he's the guy that's going to win the job eventually, whether it's uh, week one or week 15, whenever it's going to be. Not, nothing against Hector. You know how big of a Hector fan I am. I just think he's better suited for the setup role. And uh, especially if I remember correctly, I think the games Hector struggles the most is the division games. So that's why I was kind of surprised he got that closer. Uh, nod game with the first weeks just because it was all being division opponents. I feel like the Braves was a team that always kind of hurt him a little bit. So that's why I think eventually you might get Archie Bradley getting that final nod. Um, in terms of hitters, yeah, Harper is the most obvious pick, and he's going to have the most home runs on the team in, in the final uh, say. But if you're looking at a true MVP from, like, stats combined-wise, I wouldn't be surprised at the end of the year we're looking at Alec Bohm. Because I think he he could be one of your highest average hitters. He could he's not going to hit 40 home runs like Harper might or, or 35 probably, but he's going to hit that 20 at least probably 20 to 25 mark, maybe a little more than that as well. He's going to hit close to 300. I feel like um, I forget the exact number I predicted on CTP, but he's going to have probably better average than Harper, and he's going to yeah. Have you just predicted as... the higher of the home run total. I remember that because I remember all of us going, wow, we like that, 20 to 25 already. We see him <laughs> more as 15 to 20 at this point of his career as an average hitter. But Yeah, and I think with the, and then the average there, and I think he's going to have – as if he's going to sit at five the whole year, maybe even move up to four at some point, depending on the way, like you said, it was going to play out. He's going to have a ton of RBI chances, so he should have every opportunity to have just, almost just as many RBIs as Bryce Harper does, if we're being honest. So, again, Harper's going to be the guy that finishes with the most home runs on the team, but I would not be shocked at the end of the year if we're saying Alec Boehm was the top-notch, average-included kind of kind of best player and, quote-unquote, MVP of the team. Yeah, um, because of his average hitting is uh, being yeah. able to hit for averaging gaps very well. Yeah, And then... I don't know. I am tempted to pick Zach Wheeler as the Cy Young after what he did last year and everything, and he really made a name for himself, and he, he faces this division well. I'm tempted to pick Wheeler. I'm going to I'm gonna lean back towards Nola because I think he's just got more consistency in him, and kind of like you said, with him being the number one, you kind of need him to be that guy. So I'm going to agree with you on that sense and go with Aaron Nola as well. Yeah, well, um, 
Guys, we really thank everybody for uh, joining us for this Philadelphia Philly season preview for Sports Fanatic News. Uh, the Phillies are lining themselves up to improve and move towards a success. Uh, like Andrew and I both said, it seems like more so for the 2022 season where this is a year of improvement, a year of Girardi proving he's that good major league manager, which I feel he already proved with the Yankees, but, you know, he can do it again here um, and uh, prove that he's that good uh, major league manager that can get it done, which he's going to do, and get us above or at the 500 mark at least, which I think this team will be at. I think you're going to see Segura at his best with um, now having a full year away from that old hitting regimen, having a full offseason away from it. Um, and coming in this year, I think uh, that's really going to help him. Didi's going to continue to do really good here. And we're going to push and be close, but I still see, like you said, I think the Mets and um, – Padres among some other teams in the NL might be up there with us as well, uh, it, which will be the reasons to push us out. It's going to be Mets, us, or Nationals for that second wild card spot. Whoever team finishes in the second is going to get it. I don't, I'm not a big fan of the NL Central this year. I think the Cardinals have that one one, and then it's going to be Dodgers, Padres, and then depends it's really what the gonna, Brewers do because if, if the Brewers can pitch. That's all I yeah. worry about with them. Well, then they have, offense, they have an advantage because they get to face the Pirates, the Reds. The whole exactly. Year, well, we're gonna get. I, I think that's gonna be one problem if they at least can't get a second team. It's because we're gonna beat each other up so much. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I have. No, exactly. That's what it is. It depends. Uh, they are gonna beat each other up so much. These other divisions are gonna have a lot more leeway for a team to be in the wild card just because they're beat up on three of the teams in their division. Uh, this division, the Phillies can't even say that about the Marlins because they tend to struggle against the Marlins. But um, we really appreciate you all for joining us. Uh, Andrew predicted 5-2 to two score to open us up today for opening day. I predicted a 4-2 to two score to open us up today for the win for opening day. This has been the Philadelphia Phillies season preview from Sports for that News. I'm Joe Boric with Andrew Santangelo. Everybody have a great, safe, and pleasant day. And enjoy all the great baseball action. Peace out, everybody.